Hello and welcome again to World History, and this is another in our series of lectures on Chinese history. And this is, I believe, lecture number 10. The Han Dynasty, which was established around 202 BC, when Liu Bang defeated Shang Yu and was able to establish a successor state to the Chen, had persisted for over 200 years, when it was briefly interrupted by what's called the Wang Mang Interregnum, a period where the main line of descent of the Liu family had run out and Wang Mang was an official at the court who took power for himself. He died in 23 AD, and at that point the Liu family, a collateral line of the Liu family, regained the throne and resumed the rule of the Han Dynasty, which they then maintained for nearly 200 more years. This second half of the Han is often referred to as the Later Han, or sometimes as the Eastern Han, since it involved a move again of the imperial capital to the east. The second half of the Han Dynasty doesn't really have quite the drama, quite the intensity that the first half did, particularly the first century of the Han rule, when the new political order was being created when the imperial political culture was coming together, when Wu Di presided over the Han synthesis and the great expansion of Chinese territory and administrative ambitions. The second half of the Han, though, does see a period where certain social and economic tendencies, or trends, that had been developing even in the former Han, began to come to fruition. It's a period where the significant events are under the surface. They're not as immediately apparent and dramatic as the first half of the dynasty, but in some ways are just as significant. In particular, the Han dynasty as a whole is a period where the system of ownership of land, the organization, if you will, of the agricultural economy, undergoes a lot of change. Down to the Chen period, through the previous thousand years and more, the powerful rulers had basically owned all the land. Farmers who had worked on the land had done so without really owning any property of their own. They were simply the possessions, if you will, of the people who controlled the land, whether this was the Shang kings or the early Zhou kings, or later during the fragmentation of the spring and autumn in the Warring States period, whoever wielded military power essentially controlled all the economic resources within that territory. Beginning during the Warring States period, but only in a very small way, but really starting to develop during the Han period, a new system starts to emerge, a new way of organizing and conceptualizing agricultural resources begins to be put in place. This has to do with a shift in the nature of political power. During the Warring States period, during the whole of the Zhou era, the warrior elites had been the dominant group in China. The Xi, the professional political administrative elite, served the warriors, the military leaders, either of the Zhou state or the smaller states that rose and fell during the centuries of conflict. But even during that period, rulers began to reward members of their political administrations with grants of land. When the Han Dynasty comes along, as part of this creation of a new imperial system, the emphasis on a regular bureaucratic administration, staffed by a literate, educated political elite, imbued with the values of Confucianism, these various elements of the Han synthesis, now, this system of rewarding officials for service in office through grants of land becomes more common, more universal. That leads to a change in the nature of the agricultural economy. 
where it starts to develop as more of a market system, as more of a system where individual estates owned by individual families start to produce grain and other commodities, other agricultural commodities, which, if they're not entirely consumed by the estate, can then be sold, marketed, in a system which at first is local, and then, as time goes by, becomes regional, and eventually encompasses the entire empire. Land remains, at least in theory, the property of the emperor. The emperor, throughout the imperial history, is theoretically the proprietor of all land in China. But in practice, land is granted out to families, which is then passed on from generation to generation. And this develops into a de facto private property. And indeed, the legal system begins to regulate this, to recognize this. Charter grants of land. And then it starts to function as titles, as deeds. The conflict between individual landowners over access to water or other kinds of resources, these things start to be adjudicated through a legal system that in effect recognizes the rights of landowners as private property holders. This is a very significant transformation. It leads to a new order, not only a new political order, but also a new socio-economic order. The families that build up these estates, initially through service to the government, eventually become self-perpetuating. They emerge as an aristocratic elite. During the Han period, they're still very closely tied to service to the dynasty. But as time goes by, their status, their wealth, allows them to go through periods of time where perhaps no one is actually serving in government. No one from the family is a minister or an official. And yet they still retain their elite status. They retain their aristocratic prestige because of their ownership of these estates. The Han is a period of transition, by the end of which an aristocratic system with people who have prestige and status in society based upon their ownership of land, their ownership of an estate, their control of agricultural wealth, becomes characteristic of Chinese society and will remain so for much of the next thousand years. Given that there's also a transformation that takes place in terms of an elite culture, again, it's a shift away from a culture that was focused primarily on the glories of warfare, the tales of heroism and strategy that had been characteristic of the warring states in earlier periods, to now an era of cultural sophistication, when attributes of learning, of sophistication, of knowledge, of poetry, the ability to compose poetry, to write good prose, essays, things like that, to conduct sophisticated conversation, these things become culturally more significant, culturally more valued during the Han, as the nature of the dominant elite shifts, and as the Xi, the literary educated administrative elite really comes to be pretty much in exclusive possession of the leading roles in society. Within the imperial system, within the government, the dynastic system itself, rival groups seek increasingly to influence the court, to enrich themselves, to gain office for their favorites. Sometimes this is done through intermarriage. This is a problem, a phenomenon we've seen earlier in the Han, sometimes called the in-law problem, where the families of empresses try to dominate and influence the court. Military leaders, military strongmen, have been a problem in the past. Now, even though the imperial administration is becoming more bureaucratic, more concerned with civil administration, military leaders are still a force to be reckoned with. There's now a much greater division between political 
administrative power, and military power. But military strongmen still have the capacity to emerge, particularly, of course, in periods where political administration is weak for one reason or another. Finally, a third group that becomes particularly problematic later in the Han are the eunuchs. Eunuchs are castrated males who serve in the private residential parts of the imperial palace. They're meant to be non-threatening to the line of imperial succession. They're not obviously in a position to compromise the line of inheritance, and so they are used, they're employed, as service within the harem, within the residential parts of the palace, in areas where regular virile male officials are not allowed to enter. Most of the time, this isn't a problem, because the eunuchs are kept in their menial roles. But particularly in periods where emperors come to the throne as young men, sometimes even just as little boys, eunuchs can become very influential, because the little boys and young men often still live in the inner palace, in the windmen's quarters being raised by their mothers and their aunts. The eunuchs are the only other individuals, besides the women of the palace, that these young boys tend to see. Often eunuchs serve as tutors, as companions for these young princes, and if they happen to come to the throne at a young age, they're often more reliant, more dependent upon eunuchs than they are on their other court Confucian advisors. In the later Han, this becomes a particular problem because there's a series of young rulers who come to the throne, and this leads to a growth in the power of the eunuchs over the court, and they become a third force, contending along with in-law families and military leaders for dominance. This causes all kinds of problems. There are conflicts, purges, launched at court. And then, to make matters worse, the weakening of imperial oversight, the weakening of the regulatory function of the imperial, allows local strongmen, not necessarily military figures, but local landowners, some of these new emerging aristocratic families, to intensify their exploitation of the peasantry to take more wealth, take more taxes, more rents out of the peasantry. And this increases the misery of large numbers of ordinary people. Not surprisingly, this then leads to the outbreak of rebellions against the dynasty, against landlords, expanding conditions, extending conditions of chaos over large parts of China. That leads to military intervention to suppress the rebellions, and that increases the power of the military, and you get a downward spiral of contending forces that pull the dynasty apart. By the latter part of the 2nd century AD, the Han dynasty ceases to be a very functional political entity. It's still in place, Emperors continue to succeed one another on the throne, but real, effective political power dissolves, and strong men around the country take territory under their own control again. Factionalism at the court weakens the ability of the imperial state to function even further. Eventually, in the year 220 A.D., the last Han emperor is set aside, and the country breaks up at that point into three successor states, one of which is actually ruled by a member of the Liu family, a man named Liu Bai. Off in the southwest, centered around Sichuan in the southwest, the other two come under the control of people not from the imperial family. This sets up a period a very short period, only from 222 to 265 AD, 
but a very interesting period, a fascinating period in Chinese history that we call the Three Kingdoms. A member of the Liu family, as I said, rules one of the Three Kingdoms. This is a man named Liu Bai. He sets up a kingdom called Shu Han. Shu is an ancient term for the area of Shashuan, and Han obviously implies that this is a continuation of the Han Dynasty. In northern China, a man named Cao Pei founds a kingdom called Wei. The kingdom of Wei. Cao Pei is very interesting. He's the son of a man named Cao Cao, and Cao Cao was the adopted son of a eunuch. So we have a military strong man, the adopted son of a eunuch, bringing together some of these conflicting interest groups. Cao Cao was one of the people who had been jostling for power, contending for power, under the final decades of the Han and he carves out a large territory in northern China. He dies in 220, just coincidentally with the end of the Han Dynasty. And it is his son, Cao Pai, who sets up the kingdom of Wei. In southeastern China, a third state is formed, and a man called Sun Wu rules this. The state itself is also called Wu. That's a traditional ancient historical name for that part of China. So the kingdom of Wei in the north, Shu Han in the southwest, and Wu in the southeast. And what makes the Three Kingdom period so fascinating is that it becomes an age of great heroism and romance. It's looked back upon by later Chinese as a kind of golden age, not a golden age of good government or of flourishing poetry and art, the way that the Han or later the Tang dynasty are thought of, but an age of great adventure, an age unlike most periods in Chinese history. The reason for this, in part, is that the heroes of this period are not the kinds of scholars, the kinds of political officials, the kinds of emperors that we normally see portrayed as the great cultural heroes in later times, but are military men, military men noted not for their strength, not for their ability to just crush their opponents, but for their cleverness, for their wit. This is an age, the age of the three kingdoms, where deceiving your enemy outwitting your enemy, winning a fight by not fighting, is considered to be a great talent. The great successes, the great accomplishments of the heroes of the age. In addition to the individuals, I want to mention one more guy. A guy named Zhu Liang. Zhu Liang was a general. He never becomes a ruler. He never seems to have had the ambition of seizing power for himself. But he comes to be known as one of the greatest strategists, along with Cao Cao, whose exploits all take place before the actual fall of the Han. Cao Cao and Zhu Liang, during this whole period of the second century, were often held up as the great exemplars of clever strategy. The division of the empire into these three states sets up conditions for continuing warfare. It's not the kind of fragmentation and breakdown that we saw back when the Zhou uh, begin to fragment. We don't get a continuing fragmentation. You don't get dozens and dozens or even hundreds of states. You just have these three. Once they are established, they contend with one another, but they don't break down beyond this. 
the three families, the three groups that control these three kingdoms, are fairly stable amongst themselves. They also have, of course, the experience of administration and government of the Han Dynasty to fall back on, and they all present themselves as good Confucian regimes. They all employ a Confucian bureaucracy in their administrations. They all are concerned to maintain the kinds of proper order within their own territories that are characteristic, or have come to be thought of as characteristic, of good government. It's a period of fragmentation, and yet there's a lot of cultural continuity, or continuity at least in the political culture from the Han into the Three Kingdoms period, with the distinction that it is these and military heroes who are seen as the great figures of the day. What makes these guys great, what is looked back on, what becomes characteristic of them, is their, char is their cleverness, their wit. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. In one instance, a general has brought his army to the south, and they've camped on the bank of a great river. Their army is on the northern bank of the river. On the southern bank of the river are the enemy's forces. The army on the northern bank of the river has come a long way. They're far from home. Their supply lines are extended. They're in a tough spot. But if they can hold out, if they can inflict a decisive defeat on their enemy at this point, they may gain everything. So it's a critical moment. But they're in a tough spot, because in the fighting that has gone on up to this point, they have used up almost all their arrows. Bowmen, archers, are a critical component of warfare at this point. If you don't have arrows, your archers aren't going to be very useful. What they decide is to take advantage of a particular circumstance in their location which is that the river that flows between the two armies in the evenings tends to become covered with fog. It's a time of year when at night the air cools down and the air rising from the river condenses and you get a thick layer of fog over the river. They go upstream and they commandeer boats as they go along. They take all these boats and then in the boats they build dummies. They make little mannequins out of straw, and they put uniforms on these mannequins, and then they tie the boats together. They push them out into the stream, and they float downstream in the evening, just as the fog is descending on the river. On the southern bank, the sendry, the guards are very alert, and they know that particularly under the cover of fog, that this is a dangerous time, because the enemy on the northern bank may try to slip across the river and attack. So they're very much on the alert. They see coming down the river through the fog these boats, and in the boats they can't see very clearly because of the fog, but they see all the soldiers lined up, waiting to attack. They think, we figured out their clever strategy, and they're trying to sneak up on us in the fog. So they unleash a hail of arrows on these boats. Of course, the arrows stick in the straw dummies. On the northern side of the river, they haul the ropes in, and they resupply themselves with the arrows from the dummies. And this sort of story becomes legendary. It's passed down. When you study Chinese, this is one of the little texts that you learn very early on. and The title of it is Straw Boats Borrow Arrows. There's another example, and this one involves Xun Liang. He's sent out to control a certain territory. He's got a large army and has a little advance party. He has led the advance party to occupy a particular town. His main force is probably two or three days' march behind him. He's come and he's occupied this particular town. At this point, 
The enemy army is approaching. The enemy army is only about a day's march away. They've sent their scouts out ahead, and they're checking out the situation. They come up on the ridge outside of this walled town. They spy it out, and they see that Yang's forces is just a little bodyguard, and they're delighted. So they ride back, and they tell the commander that we found this guy. He's in this town. We have to ta attack him right away. We can defeat him. He's got just a tiny little force. Well, Yang's not a fool. Of course, he has had his own spies out, and they've detected the approach of the enemy. His advisors come, and they say that they have to get out of there. The enemy is only a matter of a few hours away. We have to leave as quickly as possible. Hyung Ling, however, says that, nah, I don't think so. I, I feel like staying and playing a nice game of chess. So he calls to his second-in-command and says, let's go play some chess. So they go up on the city wall, right up on the main gate. There's a little terrace there, and they set up a table. They set down a couple of chairs, and they start to play a game of chess. Now, the other commanders, they're pretty upset about this. What the heck's going on? We need to get out of here. The enemy's coming. We're going to get killed. Zheng Liang, however, says, you're overreacting. Open the gates of the the city. The gates are opened. Well, when the enemy commanders come and they look down on the town and they see that there's Liu uh, Zhang Liung and there are very few men there. But the commander looks down and he sees that Liang is playing chess. And he doesn't seem to be terribly concerned about anything. And the commander thinks for a minute. And he then orders his army to retreat. And when his subordinates ask, well, why are we doing this? We could simply swoop down there and destroy him. But the commander says, you fool. This is obviously a trap. We know that he is a smart man. This is a trap that he set for us. He's out there all by himself with very few visible troops. What fool would do that? So it's a clever deception by appearing to be unconcerned, by not caring about his situation. His opponents believe that it's a trap, and they very cleverly decide not to accept it. And so Yang is saved. These kinds of stories are the ones that become characteristic of the Three Kingdoms period. They're written down, there's poetry about them, and they become the subject of plays and operas. There's a great romance novel called The Romance of the Three Kingdoms that evolves over the centuries and becomes one of the great bestsellers. If you spend time in China today and turn on any TV show on any night on any channel, you're likely to see dramatizations of stories of the Three Kingdoms. They're very popular in China still today. The Three Kingdoms period runs on for just 45 years. It's not a very long period in Chinese history. Eventually, China is reunified, briefly, in the year 265. Another family not the Zhou family, which has been the ruling house up in the north of China, but a family called Sima, will seize power and manage to field an army which is able to defeat the forces of both Wu and Shu Han. 
from 265 to 304, a short-lived dynasty called the Jin Dynasty replaces the Three Kingdoms and brings another period of unity to China. It doesn't last very long, because around this time events which we don't fully understand out in Central Asia are taking place. And that leads to a great migration of people. Around this time, a little bit earlier than this time, there's a great movement of people from Central Asia down into Northern India, a people called the Kushan, who become a great civilization in what is now northwestern India. At the beginning of the 4th century, large groups of people, Turkic-speaking people, will later evolve into the communities of what we call today the Turks, or Turkish people, start to move into northwestern China. This leads to all kinds of changes and all sorts of transformations in Chinese history. And we will talk about that in yet another lecture. Alrighty. Thank you.